today we're going to talk about the most important things you need to know about energy basics. So this is just giving you a framework of what do we mean when we're talking about energy and, and what we're, um, what we're trying to do when we're, we're serving uh, human needs. Okay. So one of the things that gets uh, messed up a lot in media is the difference between energy and power. Those are two different things. And so energy is really a quantity. It's the amount and power is, is more like the flow rate. It's, it's the instantaneous use of that energy. So it's super easy equation when you're going between energy and power. Energy is just power times time. What you're paying for on your electric bill, you get your electric bill in kilowatt hours. That's just power times time. Your kilowatts times your power use times the number of hours you use it. You're paying for a quantity. So you can think about it as energy is like the bucket of water. It's the quantity. And the power is like the flow rate. Right? So these are two different things and, and they get it confused a lot. All right. So an important thing to think about in terms of our energy is how useful it is for us. And so let's just go back to basics and talk about thermodynamics and the laws of thermodynamics. So the first law you've probably heard, conservation of energy, really that you can't win. Energy can't be created or destroyed. So what are we talking about? We're talking about using energy resources and and providing energy services, we can transform energy from one form to another. So we can take it from something that's less useful and make it into something that's more useful, but we can't create it or destroy it. And then the second law of thermodynamics is really about how well can we you know, form, take one form of energy and convert it into another? How well can we do those conversions? And really there's just always losses. There's always losses when you're going from one form to another. Now, we're not running out of energy on or useful energy on Earth, because the Earth is actually not a closed system. We're constantly getting new energy from the sun. Energy also has this aspect of quality. So it's not just quantity. We just talked about quantity. It's also quality. It's like, how useful is it? It's talk, sometimes talked about as exergy, but it's really how useful is this form of energy? So I'm just going to give a really simple example. If I was had a weight and I was holding it above ground, so this is just like a one pound weight, that has potential energy. And we could do something with that. We could hit something or turn something that's useful and has high quality. We start dropping it, it's still got high quality. It's got potential energy. Some of that's converted to kinetic energy. It's moving. We can do something. We can crush something. We can create some, some other movement. Once it hits the ground, that energy actually converts to heat, very low heat, low quality heat. Can't really do anything useful with that. So now we've changed the quality of that energy. And that's often what we're talking about. We're talking about converting energy uh, in our energy systems. The backing up and looking big picture, what is energy and what do we care about? Energy services is what humans want, right? We want our cold drinks. We want our hot showers. We want our spaces comfortable. We want our phones and computers charged. We want to get where we're going, right? This is what we care about. Our primary energy, our energy resources, this is what exists on our planet. And so we have to take our energy resources, often do some conversion to them to get the energy services we want. And that conversion, we're converting them into what we call energy carriers, secondary energy, energy currencies. These are all terms for that form where we're carrying that, that energy from the energy resource in order to provide the energy service we want. So things like hydrogen sometimes get confused. It's not an energy resource, it's an energy carrier. We have to get it from some other primary energy resource. All right, so each time we do that conversion, we have losses. How do we measure those losses? Super simple equation called conversion efficiency. You're basically just looking at how much useful energy did you get out compared to how much useful energy you put in. You divide the out over the in and you get your, your efficiency of that conversion system. So a lot of our different conversion systems have very different efficiencies, even like in the ideal world, which isn't the real world, but it's like the best you could ever do. And I just want to give you a sense of those conversion efficiencies. So these are some of the key technologies that we use to convert from one form of energy to another. So our thermal power plants, our internal combustion engines, those are both what we call heat engines. And we're converting heat into work in both of those systems, that tends to be a very, very lossy way of doing things. And so you can see, even in the ideal world, we're only getting about half of the energy out. In the real world, what we're actually getting from our 
coal-fired power plants or internal combustion engines, we're losing 60, 70, 80% of our energy right in that energy conversion. And so when we start thinking about the impacts of using certain resources and how lossy the conversions can be to get the services we want, we really have to start thinking about how can we do that better to better provide those services with less upstream impact. Some of these things, like I just want to point out solar because solar is like, wow, we only have 20% efficient out in the field in, in our solar um, PV systems, but it's actually fairly close to the ideal world limit. And that's just because that's as efficient as we can do with a single junction. That's our typical solar panels, converting our sunlight into electricity. We can only do a little over 33% efficient. We're up to about 20% efficient in the field. What does that mean in real terms? It means you need more land. Efficiency in terms of solar just means more space to get that than amount of electricity that you want out of that system. Okay, so that's just thinking about efficiencies. And I want to take you back to thinking about the two largest energy systems that we have in the world, oil for, for transportation, coal for electricity. And each of these systems have a lot of energy conversions in them. The biggest losses are where we're using that heat to do work. So for coal, it's that thermal power plant. We just talked about you're losing 70% of your energy right there. For oil, it's really in our cars because that is also a heat engine and we're losing 80% of the 80 of the gasoline you put in is just lost. Only 20% of that is doing anything useful um, for your automobile. So these systems are lossy and they have pretty big upstream impacts so these are the things that we've got to think about and we've got to do better. There's a lot of different ways we can think about doing these systems better. And I just want to say that one of those ways of thinking about it is can we better match our energy resources to the service that we're trying to provide? Uh, this is just a fun cartoon of kind of thinking about that as a picture. If the cat's cold, it moves into the sunlight and it warms itself up. That is a direct use of an energy resource to provide the service the cat is looking for. And here in this cartoon, it's contrasting with the human that's thinking, I'm going to get some fossil fuels or uranium, and I'm going to make electricity in order to power my electric blanket to get a same, the same kind of service, right? And so that is a very lossy system to provide the same service. So we're going to talk more through the different resources about how we can make our systems more efficient and less impactful because both of those things, they can go hand in hand, but both of those things are important when we're rethinking about how do we provide the services that people really want. All right, so we've got these energy resources that exist on our planet. Uh, this is just listing them. The green ones are renewables, the blue are depletable resources, our fossil fuels and our nuclear fuels. This is what exists on the planet. And we want these end use services. We want our heating and our lighting and our, and our cold drinks and things like that. So how can we get those services? Well, let's talk first about the forms of energy or energy resources are in and how we convert them into useful forms for the energy services we need. So the sun is given, obviously is our fusion reactor in the, in the sky. It is providing a lot of radiant energy to the planet and powering a lot of these uh, resources. Both our renewable resources and our fossil fuels. Those are ultimately the storage of ancient solar energy. We also get gravitational energy, mostly from the moon, but a little bit from the sun. That's another form of energy that's coming in to our system. All right, these, these types of resources exist as chemical resources. That's our biomass and fossil fuels, our nuclear, our, our nuclear form of resources. And then we have some existing thermal resources, both from the sun directly going into to a, a thermal form and from the core of our earth in geothermal. These can provide direct, uh, direct services to us. We use radiant energy from the sun all the time to provide a lighting service. We can use our thermal sources that are on the planet to provide heating services. There are geothermal systems that provide heating for a district or something like that. We're using the core resources that we have to provide the services we want. But a lot of the times what we're doing is conversions and we're taking our chemical resources, our biomass and our fossil fuels, our nuclear resources, we're 
transforming it into a thermal form of energy. Then we're transforming that thermal energy into a mechanical energy. Remember, there's a loss every time we do this. We can use that mechanical energy directly, but a lot of times we're actually taking it all the way to electricity. And the nice thing about electricity is it's actually a high quality form of energy. We can do a lot with electricity. So that's why we take all of this effort to get these resources to electricity in order to provide a very flexible, useful form of energy. I also wanna give you the big picture that in terms of these resources that we have on our planet, both our, our stock resources and our flow resources, we're not running out. We have plenty of these. So what I'm showing you here is just a study that was done looking at our world energy consumption. This was for 2017. This is the prediction for 2040, these tiny little circles up here. And to give you a sense of what is the scale of this is the amount of resource that we have left that we can access. Natural gas, oil, uranium, coal, all of these, we are nowhere near running out of these resources. And that's total stock resources. That's total available because those are just stock. That's a set amount. Our flow resources, remember these are being powered by the sun all the time. We're getting that, that energy in every day, powering our flow resources. So you can see our solar resources is enormous. And then that powers wind, it powers biomass, it powers a lot of these other resources, hydro, but through a hydrologic cycle, all of that is powered by our sun. So in terms of meeting our energy needs, these are also large energy resources that can provide a lot of the energy needs that we have and that we predict to have in the future. So it's not a matter of running out of these resources, it's how can we best match the resource to the service that we want and lower the impact from those resources that we're choosing. So it's how we're thinking about our energy systems. The final thing I just wanna give a sense of in terms of our energy resources, obviously there's a lot of differences between them, their stock and flow, their, the amount that's available, where they're available. But one of the things that's different about them is also the energy density. And energy density matters a lot when we're thinking about impacts in terms of getting that resource and also how we use that resource. And so when you start to look at these numbers of how energy dense some of these resources are, both from a volume standpoint and a mass standpoint, you start to see why, for example, we use oil for transportation. Oil is a very energy dense resource from both a volume standpoint and a mass standpoint. And for transportation, we have to carry our energy around with us. And so we want something that is pretty small and pretty compact in order to be carrying around uh, and providing our transportation service. It also gives you a sense of where natural gas falls in this. And we're gonna be talking more about natural gas and future resources, but natural gas is a gas, not very energy dense from a volume standpoint. We can compress it. LNG would be somewhere uh, between our golf ball and our marble it would be LNG, liquefied natural gas. But you can still see that petroleum and coal are actually still more energy dense than even compressing our natural gas. And so these aspects can really come into play when we're talking about how we're gonna use these different resources, how we're going to provide them where they need to be provided. Of course, the standout here is uranium in terms of its energy density. And so a lot of times when people are talking about nuclear energy, we're talking about something that is extremely energy dense. And we'll talk more about the other aspects of uranium, both the positives and the negatives in terms of using that resource uh, for electricity production. All right, that's what I had for today and talking about energy basics. So feel free to check out these other resources.